So thank you very much for the invitation to talk about one of uh, the best and yet also one of the least known figures in Moravian history, Anna Nitschmann. She and her father were among the founders of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, um, many, many years ago, uh, 278, 279 years ago, I guess that's right, is that's what you're celebrating. However, although her position as a leader among women in the Moravian church of the 18th century is often cited, little has actually been written about her that is based on archival sources from her own hand. Scholar after scholar who has attempted to write her biography has come up against two major problems when working on Anna Nitschmann. One is what we might call the Anna Nitschmann legend, according to which even during her lifetime, she became the paradigmatic single sister, elevated through poetry, song, verse, and art to an icon. The other problem is that the almost is the almost complete lack of a scholarly biography of her, due not least to the deliberate purging of her personal correspondence, diaries, and papers after her death in 1760. So that's why I think a new look at Anna Nitschmann is so important. In the work that I've done both in my book, uh, Moravian Lives, uh, Moravian Women's Lives, and also uh, in the Digital Humanities Project, moravianlives.org, the figure and name of Anna Nitschmann come up again and again. As a role model, a leader, a pioneering female missionary to the Native Americans of Pennsylvania and New York, as the composer of hymns, as a woman who not only valued the agency of women, but who worked with single women throughout most of her life to ensure that they saw their own strength and value in the redemption of the world. In my volume of Moravian Women's Memoirs, Anna Nitschmann's name comes up repeatedly in the memoirs of other women, whether Anna Peach, with whom she worked closely on the formation and guidance of the Single Sisters Choirs, or Margrethe Junkmann, whom she met in Philadelphia and with whom she and Benigna von Sinzendorf founded the girls' school, which would later become Moravian College. Or in conjunction with Anna Rosel Anders, another one of the leaders of the Single Sisters Choir. She worked in close conjunction with brothers and sisters, and I would argue moved easily in and out of mixed groups in terms of gender and race. She was an intrepid explorer, a gifted poet, an inspirational leader, but very little is written about her. Her standing among her peers, among the Single Sisters Choir's members, for example, can perhaps be gauged from the following passage. At the news of the deaths in May 1760 of both her closest companion, Anna Nitschmann, and also the leader of the church, Nicholas von Zinzendorf, Anna Peach Seidel wrote in her memoir, now I was completely orphaned and the grief and worry in my poor soul was great, not only because of these two people, but also primarily because the settlements and choirs had now lost their lead sheep and because of how things would go, would go in the future. My anxious thoughts and premonitions did unfortunately come true in considerable measure and to my inexpressible pain, I had to witness that these dear people were almost completely forgotten, especially Anna Nitschmann, <clears throat> end of quote. I begin with this quotation, not to show how and why the Moravian church leadership after 1760 deliberately dismantled female leadership in the church um, by scoring out parts of her memoir and by getting rid of her um, correspondence and her memoir and her diaries. But rather, I, I quote this because I'd like to begin a process of rebuilding Anna Nitschmann's life story as a leader, who in other times might not have had her legacy scrubbed away and her influence denied. In the scholarship that exists on her, very little is discussed of her groundbreaking work in North America, a time that changed both Sinzendorf's estimation of her abilities as a leader, and that also led to her subsequent elevation to the mother of the church. She was sent out to America before Sinzendorf and her father David was ta were tasked with um, speaking to the disparate groups of Lutheran and reformed immigrants here in Pennsylvania, whom Sinzendorf wished to unite in a vision of the Philadelphian church. 
When she got to America, <clears throat> Anna Nitschmann learned English in the space of one year. She held conferences with Lutheran and separatist leaders of religious communities, such as Ephrata Cloister, the Dunkers, the New Mooners, the Schwenkfelders, with whom she lived in Faulkner Swamp. Her presence attracted other unmarried women to listen to her speak of Christ. She met the Lenape Indians who lived around what was to become Nazareth. And once Sinzendorf and his party arrived in Philadelphia, she worked with all these groups to attempt to secure acceptance of Sinzendorf's bold ecumenical plan. Through research in the archives in London and in Helmhut and Bethlehem, pre-COVID, I hasten to add, um, I have found evidence that survived the post-1760 purge that contradicts the traditional image of this extraordinary woman in Moravian history. Most often depicted as the shepherdess of souls or as the companion of Zinzendorf, Anna Nitschmann has never been described as a female lead, religious leader in her own right. Her iconography is one laden with ribbons and flowers and little birds and sheep hearkening back to the symbology of the sifting period. Scholarly comment on her recently dis uh, discovered sermons to the single sisters, quite remarkable that they exist. But those comments remark on the importance of finding um, a woman's writings to other women, but also dismiss them as being, quote, typically Moravian, whatever that might mean, or, quote, nothing new. Feminist scholarship has taught us, I hope, to recognize these terms as ones that a male-dominated critical discourse is used to dismiss the significance of women's contributions to art, literature, science, music, engineering, and religion. One only has to read Virginia Woolf's classic, A Room of One's Own, to see that her incisive criticisms of patriarchal historiography are unfortunately still valid. Whereas the leaders of the post Zendorfian church may have used as an excuse the need to improve the image of the Moravian church to its contemporaries, what excuse do we have today? Why, when the Moravian church has ordained women bishops for 20 years, is there still no mention of the woman who preceded them all? Now, let's see if I can go ahead. Clearly, Anna Nitschmann's contemporaries thought very differently of her. Let us take this painting that the Single Sisters Choir presented to Anna Nitschmann in 1745 on the occasion of her 30th birthday. We see 18 scenes from Anna's life that are clearly considered to be iconic for the single sister who was at that point at the age of 30 already considered the mother of the church. And I'm going to move through these quite quickly, forgive me, the resolution is not the best, it's done the best, I, I've done the best I can. So starting from the top left, we see Anna Nitschmann as a seven-year-old being forced to attend Catholic church in Moravia. Then we see her as the shepherdess of her father's sheep while she is still in Moravia. And one thing I love about these miniatures is that in order to indicate her youth, she's just painted as really small, right? She's not a child. She's just a little woman who's tiny in comparison to all the men. Um, the next slide shows us uh, Anna escaping from Moravia with her mother in 1725. Then here being received by Countess Henrietta and Katharina von Gerstorf in Bertelsdorf. Here she is working at the castle in Bertelsdorf, warming some soup for her charge, Benigna von Sinzendorf. So soup for the founder of Moravian College. Here she is um, attending a meeting of women in Helmhut, led by Admuta von Sinzendorf. Again, absolutely lovely looking at this tiny little figure there in green, right? Um, here, Sinzendorf is comforting her at the news of her brother Melchior's death in prison. Um, here she is being elected to the position of eldress of all the sisters by Admuta von Sinzendorf at the age of uh, 15. Here she is being introduced to them by Zinzendorf. Here she is at her spinning wheel, uh, dis receiving distinguished theological visitors, Zinzendorf, Leirich, Steinhofer, and Oettinger. And I'm going to come back to this slide because it's very important. Here she is receiving first communion um, 
in Bertelsdorf. Here she is with um, Benigna von Zinzendorf and her brother Christian Renatus von Zinzendorf at the foot of the Ronneburg after Zinzendorf had been exiled from Saxony. Here she is setting off um, to London with Zinzendorf and Altmuta. Um, here she is with uh, Zinzendorf's mother in Berlin. She's grown up now, right? She's bigger. Um, here she is saying goodbye to the single sisters in Marienborn in 1740, just before she comes here to America. I love this picture. Look at all of those women with their handkerchiefs dabbing their noses because she's leaving, right? Actually, they're huge handkerchiefs. Um, here she is leaving on the ship to, with her father to go to America, stormy seas. Very famous picture here, uh, Anna Nitschmann preaching to a group of Quakers in Philadelphia. This picture has caused a lot of critical comment, talking about her as a woman preaching, right? And here, a quite fictitious event, um, the supposed meeting of Zinzendorf and Anna in a forest somewhere in Pennsylvania in 1741. So those um, pictures, uh, at the bottom of those pictures, we have these two, where we see an angel on the right holding a portrait of Anna Nitschmann, um, and then being that portrait, I've cut out a piece of the bottom here, but you can see then um, supposedly these are native peoples and also other non-Europeans, judging by palm trees, um, who are admiring Anna's picture. We will come back to um, this uh, later. So I wanted to go back to this one, this slide here. The, this exquisite collage reveals not only the esteem in which Anna Nitschmann was held by her choir, but also the events of her life that caused them to hold her in that esteem. Her simple beginnings, her flight to Helmholtz at the age of 10, her election at the age of 15 to the office of Eldress, her closeness to the family, and the fact that she is repeatedly uh, met and uh, visited by leading church figures. And she preaches both to men and women and also shows her bravery in the mission field. So there are two specific moments I want to focus on in Anna's life between 1735 and 1742. So she's still in her twenties during this period, okay? Um, where she displays those characteristics of a leader of the church as a leader of women and as a religious leader in the model of other women religious leaders in the Western church. For example, women like Hildegard von Bingen, Mechthild von Magdeburg, and the 17th century visionary Madame de Guyon. Anna Nitschmann studied these women, right? She read these women's works and other later pietistic thinkers. So not only was she visited by these men while she was sitting at the spinning wheel, but she also discussed the ideas of pietism and mysticism with them. She also wrote to these men. So rather than look at her sitting at the spinning wheel um, and think of this as a kind of visual translation of a trope of the visitation of the Magi to Christ, maybe we could reinterpret this particular moment as a pivotal one in Anna's life. After this meeting, Anna considered taking the path of contemplation and seclusion um, following right, the medieval mystics. But she was persuaded by Sinzendorf not to do that, but to rather take a path of Christian action in the world. And we can see this in her memoir, where she writes about this meeting and then what happened after this particular meeting. Now, as most of you know, I write a lot about Moravian memoirs. Um, and it's remarkable to me that Anna Nitschmann's memoir was not published until 84 years after her death in German. And then it was only an abstract. And it wasn't translated into English until um, 139 years after she died. Okay, but this is what she says in her memoir. And I, I, forgive me, I don't normally read out quotes, um, but this is quite a long one. So I thought you might like to have it up here. On the 24th of November, 1735, my 20th birthday, the savior revealed himself in a most powerful manner to me. A short time before, some brethren had advised me to read the lives of St. Teresa, 
by Madame Guillon, a French mystic writer. I was delighted with the book and wished to follow in St. Teresa's footsteps. There were precious truths set forth in the volume, but the all essential point was wanting, that point in which all the other doctrines of God's world center, the ransom price paid for our sins, the atonement made by our savior for a guilty world. Conventual life I gradually perceived would not have suited me, although I was not insensible to its attractions. I saw that to spend my days immured in a cell would ill become one whose calling it is to work and to do battle for Christ. Our savior led me to see this, though for a whole quarter of a year, my mind was more or less unhinged and distracted by various thoughts and fancies which call for shame and humiliation. Thus I had my trials, but the friend whom my soul loved helped me out of all my difficulties and showed me that my safest course was to become as a little child. I find this passage remarkable for various reasons. First, what spurred this contact with her from two leading figures in Württemberg pietism at the time? Why would they not only have written to her, but also made the trip across German, all the German states to visit her? Second, Anna here recognizes the need for spiritual leadership in the practice of her faith and the need for a revised theology of action. Oettinger and Steinhofer were already well known to Zinzendorf and his family. Oettinger had studied philosophy and theology at Tübingen and was a devout reader of Jakob Böhme, someone who um, Anna and Zinzendorf also read. In 1730, he had visited Zinzendorf and Herrnhut and had remained for several months teaching uh, Hebrew and Greek. And he is, of course, best known as the German translator of Swedenborg's works, um, an involvement that brought him much censure from his church superiors. The other visitor, Friedrich Christoph Steinhofer, was also a theologian <clears throat> who visited Helnhut and Sinzendorf for the first time in 1731. Sinzendorf accompanied Steinhofer on his trip to Württemberg in 1731 and recognized that he was a potential ally of the Moravians and saw that he received a position in Ebersdorf as the court preacher. From 1735 on, Steinhofer was the minister in Ebersdorf in the Falkland. Although he later left the Moravians, he was for a time their bishop for what was known as the Lutheran Tropus. So this visit represented here on this miniature was not apparently a singular occurrence. From the newly cataloged records in the Unity Archives in Helmhut, we can find that the correspondence between these two churchmen and Anna Nitschmann stretches over a period of at least two years. Now, unfortunately, Anna's um, responses are not available, and I can't wait to be able to travel again, and COVID is over, to get back to the archives in Helmhut to be able to work out what was said during these conversations. Now, a clue might be given in um, Doug Shantz's essay on men, women, and their experience of God, in which he examines Anna Nitschmann's early memoir in the light of the history of spiritual narratives, looking for ways in which male and female discourse about relationships to Christ might differ. Comparing Franke and Anna Nitschmann's pietistic autobiographies Chance highlights the images and tropes typical to mystical women's writings in Anna's memoir. He describes Anna as following the way set out for her by Christ. And as we can see from Anna's own words cited, um, sorry, cited, hmm, it's not gonna play, cited here, um, she, uh, she is deeply moved by the writings of St. Teresa. She is also following the way set out for her by Catholic mystics because a Protestant tradition had not yet been played. Although, uh, <clears throat> although others did not follow this train of thought, Anna does in her memoir. She sees the need to enhance the writings of mysticism with a deeply Lutheran Moravian consciousness of the debt she owes Christ for salvation. For salvation. This is also the time in which Anna Nitschmann composed her own hymns. She was especially productive as a hymn writer between the years of 1735 and 1748, 
composing them while in Germany, England, and North America. In fact, the 1741 um, hymn book contains 56 hymns of her composition, the most famous of which is Verlobter König, um, which I guess is the promised king. Hymn writing, according to Zinzendorf, is humanity's way of speaking to God. And I would argue that after this meeting in 1735, one of the choices of, for action that Anna Nitschmann makes is to provide a devotional and linguistic model for single women to express their religious um, piety, their commitment to service and their sisterhood to her. And if we take a brief look at those hymns uh, that she composed, we can find the text speak of humility, of dependence on Christ, on sacrifice, on the nature of a Christian life of action. She describes this life in a wonderful quotation as, quote, like a lamb in the home and a lion when I roam. Pretty good, eh? That could be a college motto, I think. Um, and also a devotion to the Moravians as well. Why is it not working? Oh. Okay. Um, so the second moment I would like to examine is that which follows five years after Anna's crisis of 1735, namely the time of her activities in America. And I've put together a, a map here. Um, what you can do is if you click on, if you type in that, if you're interested, if you type in that um, URL, you'll get a, what's called a story map, which um, shows you Anna Nitschmann's life uh, mapped out, okay? So if you're bored with what I'm saying, you can always noodle around on the internet and have a look at that. Um, so Anna Nitschmann's um, behavior of being a lion in when she roamed was actually the cause for some of the most virulent opposition to the Moravians among the Lutherans and their leaders in Pennsylvania. They did not like the fact that she was such a fearless leader. Um, one of the major sources for knowing this is an anti-Moravian tract by Alexander Volk in 1750, where one of the deeds that proves if you, for him Anna Nitschmann's wickedness was that she performed the sacrament of baptism. Um, the author writes that when Anna Nitschmann was in Pennsylvania, there are accounts, some eyewitness, of her administering the sacrament of baptism to other women. Um, Anna Maria Seibold is the person in question. There is plenty of evidence, the author continues, for Moravian women participating in the distribution of sacraments at communion. So why would anyone doubt that Anna Nitschmann would also perform baptisms? Of course, to take the words of one of the most virulent opponents of the Moravians as reliable would be risky. Were it not for the ample evidence of Anna's remarkable ministry prior to this point, right? So it's very likely that when she went out into the, into the Pennsylvanian hinterlands, that she would have performed baptisms, which is really quite revolutionary, um, a little revolutionary, I think you say, um, at Moravian College, right? For a woman, a single woman in the 18th century, it's really quite remarkable. Early on, the leaders of the Moravian church recognized her abilities as a potential leader here in America. Um, it was decided that she um, would come to America at the age of 25 with her father <clears throat> to work among the German speaking people in Pennsylvania. Both Zinzendorf and Spangenberg considered the fact that Anna was a woman to be a good thing, to be a decisive factor in her efficacy as a missionary, because it would allow her to speak better with what they called the haughty and independent colonists. Of course, I'm British, so I'm bound to say that. Right? Um, so in 1740, Anna wrote her farewell letter to the congregation in anticipation that she would never come back. But her years here her, were absolutely pivotal. They were a turning point in her own realization of her calling, in Sinzendorf's estimations of her abilities, and also in the practice of female leadership among the Moravians. Although in 1740, before she came here, 
she had resigned her office as general eldress because she was uncertain as to what she would meet in the new world, her time here solidified her reputation as one of pietism's most important leaders. After an arduous journey, Anna, her father, and several companions, but not Sinzendorf, arrived in Philadelphia on December 15, 1740, and traveled immediately to the Moravians' newly purchased lands in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Their arrival was known to many of the other German sects who had settled here in the province, um, such as the Brethren at Ephrata Cloister, and they sub subsequently came to visit her. Anna's plan that Sinzendorf had worked out for her um, was to work with all of these disparate groups in the hopes that her words, rather than the words of a man, would bring them all together in a truly Philadelphian ideal. To this end, Anna and her father David traveled around Pennsylvania in the summer of 1741, visiting um, Conrad Beisel in Ephrata and the Associated Brethren of Skipak. So if you have gone onto the digital map, you're gonna be able to look at all of those places that she visited. She, went, she was very, very active. During her time here, she wrote regular letters back to Helmholtz to Benigna von Sinzendorf, to the Single Sisters Choir, and to those she had left in charge of the choir. In a letter dated um, April 1741, she describes her activities among the peoples here, a place that is a huge confusion, ein gar großes Gewirre, she says, of different sects and varying religious opinions. Anna uh, recognized that these people were just waiting for someone to come and care about them. In the three months after her arrival, she had already gathered 20 young women together who sought the savior and eagerly anticipated the school, which is Moravian College, um, that she and ben Benigna were to found. Although she was living with and working for one of the brethren of Skipak, she visited the Nazareth tract regularly and noticed the many Native Americans who visited her. As she was clearing the land, she was helped by the Lenape women and young girls to carry wood and water. Oh, Benigna, she writes in one of her letters, if only you were here to work with them. Anna's magnetic presence attracted many other young women. So despite the plan that a single sister's choir should not be founded in Bethlehem, Anna had other ideas. Not only did she gather these women together, she was quite militant in her defense of them staying unmarried, which again in the 18th century was quite unusual. In another letter back to Herrenhut, Anna congratulated one of the other single sisters for refusing to get married. Um, in November 1741, Anna Nitschmann returns to Germantown to set up a girls' school with Anna Margareta Bechtel and to await Sinzendorf's arrival. On December uh, 9th, 1741, almost exactly a year after she arrived in America, Sinzendorf and his daughter Benigna arrived in Germantown. Due to his lack of both financial and linguistic preparation, Sinzendorf deferred to Anna Nitschmann. Who, had used the, who used the unspent money she had been given in Herrenhut to help the count. Sinzendorf also relied heavily on Anna's knowledge of English to communicate with other German settlers in the province and English settlers as well. As Sinzendorf embarked on his plan to proselytize the Native Americans and to try to unite German sects in the colony, Anna Nitschmann became a crucial factor in his success. How am I doing on time, Justin? How much longer do you want me to? Kate, you're doing just fine. Um, I would say <laughs> another maybe five minutes and then we can start the question and answer okay. session. That would be great. All right. Okay, all right. Um, in that case, I'm going to um, jump ahead. Uh, so it always takes longer than you think. Um, all right, I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, she about the time when she was in Yorkshire in England and how successful she was there um, and move here to um, the conclusion. All right. In his precious volume on 
sins and orphan women, that contemporary debates on women, about contemporary um, debates on women's voting rights. The archivist of the Moravian church, Otto Uttendorfer in 1919, researched the tradition of women's agency within the unity of the brethren. Uttendorfer cites at great length Sinzendorf's speeches and sermons to the married and single men and women on the topic of gender. In his book, Uttendorfer is not interested in theology or sifting period language. Rather, he focuses on the theory and practice of women in the Moravian church. The earliest text on this topic is a speech Sinzendorf gave to women in Philadelphia in 1742, where he argues women are blessed by the fact that they can hold inside them, contain and gestate God the divine. This is of course resonant with orthodox theology <coughs> and the name for Mary, the Theotokos. Sinzendorf calls on women to conceive of themselves as carriers of the divine. His sermons on women should also be heard by men as men need to learn from women the way of the divine. He sees the single sisters choir houses as places where women lead not cloistered lives, but are educated to be leaders. He called them Prophetenschulen, schools for prophets. I return to the image, I think it's over here, um, of Anna receiving the two prominent churchmen at the spinning wheel and in front of her floor loom. In these single sisters choir houses, the spinning and weaving of cloth were two of the most prevalent economic and artisanal activities. I would also argue that in addition, in addition to producing vital goods and income for the congregation, spinning and weaving are also traditional tropes of women's wisdom. As we know from classical and medieval literature, the image of the woman at the loom has for thousands of years signified an alternative realm of knowledge generation, whether it is Penelope in the Odyssey, Clytemnestra in the Oresteia, or Custine de Pizan in the City of Women, the creation of cloth is also a creation of knowledge and narrative. Anna Nitschmann's spinning and weaving is an image of her other realm of knowledge acquisition and transmission. Listening to the words of the visiting pietist scholars, Anna continues to work. If the, work, if the choir houses are to be considered as the workshops of the divine, then it is no surprise that Sinzendorf also considers them to contain prophets and priests. Prophets are those who further the work of the choir, they have the authority to lead um, in the right direction, and the priests are those who work with the spiritual well-being of the choir. Thus for Sinzendorf, priestesses are eldresses, prophets are female disciples. Uttendorfer himself points to Sinzendorf's extraordinary reliance upon women um, a Quakerish trait that was not approved of by all leaders of the church and that later led to restrictions of women's roles. But for Zinzendorf, Anna Nitschum was both a priestess and a prophetess. Her legacy <clears throat> to the history of pietism lies in her significant contribution to, to mission work, hymnody and religious leadership. And her efficacy in the mission field was enormous. Although very much under-researched, evidence reveals that Anna's interactions with American Indians in Pennsylvania was effective and long-lasting, and her work in establishing the girls' school in Philadelphia was foundational. By 1755, just five years before her untimely death, the minutes of the Synod of the Single Sisters Choir showed that membership around the world of the choir that Anna had founded totaled approximately 3,000 people, with choirs in Greenland, England, North America, the German states, Ireland, the Baltic states. The registers for the following year show a growth to 4,200. At this very synod, Sinzendorf makes the remark that he wishes that he were a single sister. Interesting. So on this picture, a fascinating picture, the depiction of the non-European staring at Anna's picture with reverence 
is actually accurate. There is archival evidence from the diaries of the single sisters choirs established in the mission world that portraits of Anna were distributed as far afield as Greenland. We might well ask why, when she herself never visited those places. The records show that Anna Nichman corresponded with the single women throughout the mission world in North America and in the Danish West Indies, in Greenland, in South Africa, in West Africa, in Persia and Egypt, and even in the diaspora in Poland. So why is a re reconsideration of Anna Nichman as a leader so important? I think for women today, she still acts as a role model, as a paradigmatic woman leader, a pioneering woman missionary to the Native Americans of Pennsylvania and New York, as a composer of hymns, and as a woman who not only valued the agency of women, but who worked with women throughout most of her life to ensure that they saw their strength and um, leadership value to the redemption of the world. Anna Nichman as a reader and a thinker is perhaps a new icon that needs to be added to her gallery of tropes. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm done. I will stop sharing so that I can see people. Thank you so much, Dr. Fall, for the great presentation and uh, just an incredibly rich history that Moravian has, has had over the past 279 years. So really appreciate um, such an informational and fantastic presentation. Then as Amanda had said at the beginning um, of the evening, we would like to take any questions that any of our participants have for Dr. Fall. And um, you can either submit those in the chat and we can read those directly to Dr. Fall or you can just message me in the chat and I can call on you live to ask your question. Um, and Dr. Fall, it looks like Lori Ann has a question right now. Um, her question is, how did Anna Nitschman come to um, be wed to Count Zinzendorf? <laughs> That's the question everybody wants an answer to, right? Um, so it's, that's, I mean, there are various theories. Um, reading what is left of the archival information, I think um, it was seen that he had, first of all, he had to have a spouse, right? Because of the work that he did with married women um, and married men as well. And she was the obvious candidate. Um, but I think also that she, after the America trip, when they went to England and then um, the, and their travels afterwards, it's very clear that Anna is his partner. Um, now, to what extent I mean partner in a perhaps modern sense, um, I, I'm not sure, but I think that um, Sinzendorf saw her as his spiritual partner, certainly. Um, after his wife, his first wife died, um, they were probably um, married in secret and very few people knew about it. Um, and it was only in 1758 that it was announced that she um, was now his wife. There are um, accounts by her brother who was um, uh, Sinzendorf's secretary that marital relations between them were not successful. Anna did not particularly want that kind of relationship with Sinzendorf. Um, and, and her brother writes about her being unhappy. Also, um, when Sinzendorf is dying, um, he is in the Vogt's house, he is in his mansion in, in Helmhut, and she is actually back in the Single Sisters Choir house. Um, she watches his funeral cortege go past from her window um, in the single sister's house. And she, of course, herself is ill at that time. But I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done um, in digging up archival sources. These are in Helmholt, um, some I found in London as well. Um, and as I said before, once COVID restrictions on travel are lifted, um, I'm very excited to be able to go investigate um, some of those um, sources. So that's all I can tell you right now. Um, 
Thank you. And a question from Dr. Grigsby, uh, president of the college. Uh, Dr. Grigsby is wondering from the pictures that you had in your presentation of Anna and kind of understanding the, med the medieval mystics um, like Hod von you know, Bingen, was she seen as a mystic or do we have any particular mm. record of uh, mysticism? No, that's a really good question. Um, I think that she's, <clears throat> she rejects mysticism in its cloistered form, right? So her theology is definitely very much the theology of, um, uh, of complete devotion and piety, but she's also a woman of action. Um, and she made that choice. She talks about that choice as well. Um, I mean, it's a much larger question. Is the, in the, in the 1740s, is the Moravian concept of human relationship with the divine based in a mystical tradition? And I would say absolutely, yes, it is. And if she is following that tradition, it is not surprising at all. Sinzendorf himself had read the mystics, she's reading the mystics, and that's one of the ways in which they can talk about, for example, heavenly marriage, right? Um, the marriage with Christ, uh, which is enacted within um, the marital bed, as far as Sinzendorf is concerned. So that's a really good question. And it's, um, I think that it has led people to think of Moravians as not being people of action. Um, especially in Germany, in uh, when we talk about the Herrenhuter, but I think that that is a false impression that that Moravians really, especially in Britain, right, the British Moravians are very much seen as people of um, of trade, people of action, people of exploration, and having done lots and lots of work on the Moravian memoirs through now the Moravian Lives website. Um, moravianlives.org if you want to look it up um, you know the, all of the memoirs I've read they're much more about movement and travel and and meetings than they are about cloistered contemplation so um, and that's by men and women so thank you uh, two questions from Janet. Um, how long did Anna live? And then for how many years was she involved in starting Moravian with Benigna? And can you, you know, can you speak a little bit about their relationship and how they met? Oh, sure. So um, she was 45. She was born 1715, died 1760. Um, she met Benigna as her sort of servant, right? So when what happened uh, when the um, the exiles from Moravia started showing up on Sinzendorf's estate, Sinzendorf actually took in many of them as servants um, in his household or to work in his barony. And um, there was that one picture you might remember of uh, Anna bending over the fire and making a soup for Benigna, right? So that was her first role with Benigna was to take care of her. She was younger than her um, and she was sort of like her nanny. Um, and then that changed, right? Then when they started talking about theology, talking about Jesus, um, they formed, uh, they decided that they would form the Single Sisters Choir together. Um, and she became very quickly the leader of that choir. Now, in terms of um, the founding of Moravian College, I need to tread on uh, gently here, right? This is your territory. And I've seen the beautiful statue um, of Benigna down, uh, down by the Monocacy Creek. No, not by the Monocacy, down by the Lehigh. Um, I think that the preparatory work, as I said in my talk, was done by Anna Nitschmann and by uh, Margareta Bechtel. Um, and it started in Philadelphia with the Germantown School. And so I think that, yes, the female seminary was started in Bethlehem, um, but the people who gathered women together to study and to think and to live together, um, the person who started that was Anna Nitschmann with uh, uh, Margareta Bechtel. And then when Benigna came, 
she was the noblewoman, right? She's the daughter of the count. And so it's not surprising then that she would be the figure around whom um, the school would crystallize, right? She is the daughter of the count rather than Anna Nishman who was a commoner. And so, and then you probably also know that that was one of the reasons why when Sinzendorf and Anna did get married, it was kept a secret because she was not of the nobility and it was considered to be pretty scandalous that he married a commoner. So I think that, I think that class plays um, a large role in the historiography as well. I think you just sort of spoke to this, um, but Leah was wondering, you know, how would you describe sort of Anna's involvement with Benigna and, and her role with starting, you know, Moravian College? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think I've sort of spoken to that. Um, I think what is very, very cool, if I may say so, is the fact that Moravian College is founded by three women, right? I mean, whether it's one woman as the countess or the three women together, I think that's very powerful. It's a very powerful testament to the tradition of seeing women as leaders and educating women to be leaders. And I think that's a very exciting um, genesis. So. And um, a question for Marilyn, did um, Anna have any sort of formal education via you know, tutors or any type of schooling at all? No. No, I mean, she came from a very poor family, right? Her father was a carpenter. She was a shepherdess. The only education she received was through um, reading, learning to read the Bible and reading um, hymns and writing hymns. Um, and so, but I think that that's very um, typical for that period, uh, that formal schooling was not something that was, um, that was open two women of her class. However, it's very clear that she was a very intelligent person if she is able to um, hold discourses with leading theologians of the time. And that's why I made that allusion to sort of, you know, <clears throat> Christ in the temple, right? And, and we have to think about that too in the hagiography of Anna Nichman in that, um, in that miniature, right? Um, that, it's, you know, the, the, mirac the miracle of her uh, leadership is being traced, I think, quite a lot through the, the, the life story of Christ, right? It's a hagiography that follows a pattern. Um, and I think that's fascinating as well. And, maybe, and that is also one of the reasons why when she died, um, the, the new leaders of the church wanted to bury this history, this history of women's leadership, and even, um, you know, alluding to the fact that a woman could follow a life pattern that had been set out by Christ. And then just as a follow up on that, Lynn asked, you know, with not having any sort of formal education or tutoring, how did she learn to read initially? You know, what? what it would have been through process? the Bible, right? So it would have been through Bible classes, um, through reading passages of scripture um, through singing hymns and I think that's what's so remarkable about Moravian education around the world is that um, wherever the Moravians were in their mission movements they they had um, the, first and foremost the mission to teach people to read and write so Mary Prince for example um, in Antigua is taught to read and write by the Moravian missionaries on Antigua. And that's very, that's a, it's a, it's a very powerful um, moment, I think. Great. Um, one final question from Corey uh, that I have is, it's a little bit of a long one. Um, Anna Nitschun was, you know, clearly very strong, influential, revolutionary as a female leader. Uh, but consequently, Count Zinzendorf, who was also very close with Anna, uh, was known for sort of his more progressive promotion of the role of women um, in the church and their sort of controversial uh, assertions. Based on your research, have you come across any evidence that would suggest that Anna was influenced um, by his attitude toward women and their role in the church? Or do you think that they were you know, sort of two birds of a feather, if you will. I think it was the other way around. 
I think that Anna Nitschmann is the one who convinced him that women were capable of, of these things. And I think that's what I've tried to argue. Um, I think especially when he saw Anna, what Anna had done here in America, in Pennsylvania, that's when he decided that, you know, it, we, that he was not just going to talk about women as um, uh, in a, um, a, a conceptual sense, right? But he was actually going to say that women can be practical leaders as well. And that after this trip to America, she becomes the mother of the church. She deposes Benignif uh, Ermutter von Zinzendorf, right, his wife, from that position. She becomes the mother of the church because he sees her as being the, 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 the leader and the, the, if you like, the, the religious leader as well. So I do think that it's actually the other way around, that he may have had these concepts earlier, but actually she is putting these ideas and practice. I'm not saying she's a feminist. <laughs> um, I think that takes us a whole different, down a whole different path, right? Um, but I'm saying that Sinzendorf's own already, um, he's open already to the concept of women as leaders. And then Anna, right, shows him what she can do. And that's when he was convinced then, and everything changes, everything changes. When she's in Yorkshire, after she leaves America, she's preaching to thousands of people in Yorkshire, in England. And she says, she's telling them stories about Pennsylvania, about the native people here and about what her work was. And she said, they listened to her like hungry bees. Thousands, right? She's standing up on a hill preaching. It's an amazing image. No wonder people were threatened by that as well. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Anyone else have any final questions before we wrap up tonight's event? So I'm hoping to write this all up. Um, it's my next book is going to be on women leaders in the Moravian church. So thank you for listening. You heard an early version of one of the chapters, so. Well, great, that's exciting, Dr. Fall. And I am going to include my contact information in the chat to everyone. If you do have any uh, additional questions or any um, thing that you would like me to follow up with Dr. Fall on, I can certainly do that and we can get those questions answered for you. Thank you for Before listening. We... Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended for tonight's presentation. Uh, great opportunity to really showcase Anna and her incredible impact on the Moravian community. Uh, we've certainly had an incredible 279 year history and um, hope that we can continue that for the next 279 years. So um, I am going to put a link in the chat right now um, for everyone if they so wish to help continue um, Anna's legacy, and you can find out different ways that you can leave an impact on Moravian. I would also like to take this time to say that I hope to see some of you tomorrow night as we continue with our Founders Day program this year. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be joined by three remarkable alumna who have made an impact as leaders within their workplaces, communities, and their alma mater here at Moravian. So I wish that everyone has a great rest of your night. And once again, thank you for supporting our virtual engagement events here at the college. Take care, everyone.